All right, everybody ready? 6.30. Daniel, we're moving on. Daniel chapter 11 tonight. Daniel chapter 11. Got this chapter and one more chapter, and, and we'll be uh, through Daniel. Uh, and I'll go ahead and let you guys know uh, that I'll, I, I want to do the book of Ezekiel. Never studied the book of Ezekiel. We're going to do that one, so we're going to move through Daniel. I think while we're on this prophecy time, you know, I want to make sure that we really look at a lot of the prophecies. So where are we at? Remember, Daniel loves his people. And I keep telling you often that I try to pull out not just the, I don't want us to be a church that's just give me the facts, man. You know, I want us to understand the, the principles. You know, uh, I was watching this little movie about the Apostle Paul last night, and this guy was saying that, that Jesus of Nazareth, he had one, one word clears up his whole message. One word clears up his whole time here, and it was love. Love. And I'm like, well, that's, that's good, but, you know, the world likes to turn world. But one of the things that I want you to see from Daniel that we should be really focused on in our lives today in the church as Christians it is our love for one another and how important that is. That was very important to Jesus that, that we love one another. And he said, you will know, they will know you are my disciples by your love for one another. And, and that's, um, I think maybe it's tougher in our day and time uh, because of just circumstances in people's life and backgrounds. But, but I want to encourage you to look at Daniel, look at how much he loves his people. He has started praying because he knows from Jeremiah's prophecy that the 70 years has to be up. He knows he's looking for uh, his people to be restored back to their land. And so he begins to pray, and, and he's already seen these visions towards the end of time. And you can imagine Daniel at his age just being overwhelmed with all the things that, that he has known about from, you know, King Nebuchadnezzar having the vision, the dream of the statue, and how the... He found out, he told him what that meant, and then the beast coming out of the sea, they told him what that meant, and now he's thinking of this 70 years is up, so he's praying hard, and we learned last week that he began praying, and the angel came to him and said, as soon as you started to pray, as soon as you humbled yourself, you know, he was sent. God sent this angel to come and to, and to give him understanding, okay? God wants him to have understanding, but he got delayed for 21 days because he's fighting with this demon that was over Persia. Until Michael comes, Michael the archangel comes to help him. And, and so the angel now comes to explain again the future to Daniel. Um, somebody might say, well, why is he getting so many visions or so many answers from God over and over and over about the future? One of the big things you're going to see in chapter 11 that I really need to stress to you is we all know, I told you from the beginning of study this uh, studying the book of Daniel, that people, skeptics of the Bible, people who do not like the Bible, do not like our God, they want they go after the book of Daniel. And really they go after the book of Daniel mainly because of chapter 11 and chapter 12. The detailed prophecies in chapter 11, I mean, it's given exact details of things that's going to happen 150, 200 years, as we'll see tonight. Now, tonight is a history lesson. I'm going to go ahead and warn you. I told Destiny, I said, this is not particularly one of my favorite things to teach on, Daniel chapter 11, but it, God put it in there, so what does that mean to us? It's very important. So you have to learn how to train yourself to listen to every bit of God's Word. If you say, well, I'm not a history person, well, discipline yourself to be a history person. Well, I'm not a doctrinal person. Train yourself to be a doctrinal person. I'm not a theological person. Train your mind to understand what God has for you, to look for the meanings here. So uh, Daniel knows, obviously, his people have been in bondage for 70 years. It has to be close. He's been in deep, long prayer for his people. The Holy Spirit stressed that, for his people. And we're going to see that this chapter has some of the most uh, detailed, fulfilled prophecies in the whole Bible, predicting history of over 375 years all the way to the end. Uh, and, and, and this amazing accuracy is what we can show people. How in the world could Daniel have known this? And they're going to tell you, as you'll hear me say tonight, well, he's looking back. Somebody's looking back, and they're writing it. No, 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 no. One of the, what's one of the first things I showed you when they went into captivity in, in Babylon that we can use against these skeptics? Because they say, well, it was written in Aramaic. 
Why did Daniel write in Aramaic? Because he's in, he's in uh, Babylonia, captivity, with the Chaldeans, and that's what they spoke. So he couldn't use Hebrew. He wrote in that language. But as soon as uh, Cyrus comes in and they begin to go back, Daniel changes. There in about Daniel 6, Daniel 7, he changes and writes in Hebrew. So that's a huge point that you can talk to skeptics about. And I've tried to encourage you all through these studies that we don't just talk with people and say, well, you know what, I have this blind faith. You have so much, so much that you can defend your faith with. Archaeology, history, you know, the Bible itself. The Bible defends itself. You don't have to defend it. But people just don't know it until you share it with them, right? So it's our, So pay attention to these things and be excited about sharing with other people what you're learning. So look at verse 1, Daniel chapter 11. And it says, In the first year of Darius the Mede, I arose to be an encouragement and a protection for him. So Darius the Mede, we already know from previous chapters uh, that this is 539 B.C., in the first year of Darius the Mede. We saw that Darius received the kingdom at the end of chapter 5. The Bible says that he was 62 years old. And we know that this Darius was kind uh, to the children of Israel. He was going to allow them to go back to Jerusalem. So it makes sense here when we see that the angel says, I rose to be an encouragement and a protection for him. Why would this angel of God be an encouragement or protection for someone who is against the people of God? He's not. So we see that this Darius the Mede is showing that he is actually a kind person to the children of Israel. And this kind of confirms that uh, by showing that the angel is encouraging and protecting uh, this Persian king. Look at verse 2. And now I will tell you the truth. Behold, three more kings are going to arise in Persia. Then a fourth will gain far more riches than all of them. As soon as he becomes strong through his riches, he will arouse the whole empire against the realm of Greece. So he's, the angel's telling him what's going to happen in the future. It's the cool thing about young people. Listen to me. I've used the example of the lottery ticket before. If I tell you the lottery number, you know, for the next 320 times they draw a lottery and I hit it perfect, are you going to believe I can tell the future? That's what this Bible is. And this is a great example of it. He tells him there's going to be three Persian kings that come after Cyrus, and they did. Cambius, uh, Cambysius, he was in 530 to 522 B.C. Pseudo Smyrtus was in 522 B.C., he only served a year. And then Darius, his Hystopis, I can't pronounce all these names, Hystospices, 522 to 486 B.C. And then the fourth is Xerxes, the one also called Ahasuerus in the book of Esther. He goes by Ahasuerus there. And he served from 486 to 465 B.C. So we know that Daniel left to captivity in 605 B.C. And he's probably 80 years old now. So we're in the 525 something range. And, and these things are coming after uh, 540. But anyway, these things are coming after Daniel. These things are coming in the future. And he's telling. Now some of them will be in Daniel's lifetime. But he's telling him the future, and we can look back with it. And listen to me on this. Without even using the Bible, you can just use history, recorded history, and they will tell you who the kings of Persia were. And it's just what the angel told Daniel. God is using this book. Remember I told you last week, this book. God is sending this message out to make Daniel have understanding of what is going to come. The critics of the Bible... They want to say that this was written 400 years later by someone looking back because of the details of these four kings and the exact uh, timeline that they came in. Would the Babylonian and Persian kings be so kind to Daniel or use him the way that they did if Daniel was a liar? You remember all that the people have seen? For the past 80 years, 70 something years? You remember what they've seen from Daniel? He interpreted the dreams of Nebuchadnezzar. Nobody could do it. Nebuchadnezzar didn't even know what his dream was. Daniel had to tell him the dream and then told him what it meant. How about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Hundreds and thousands of people out there, and they all saw this. They saw these men thrown into that furnace and they did not burn up. 
How about Daniel in the lion's den? Okay, these the word has spread about this Daniel for years. And then a new king comes in, Cyrus, and immediately sets him up as a like a president over the nation. Why would you do that if this man is not trustworthy? If this man's a liar? This is showing you that that non-Jewish people, non you know, believers in our God had trust in this man. He's not a liar. Daniel's telling the truth. Uh, and the prophecy is going to show us, again, like we saw back in chapter 8, it's going to show us the entire Persian rule all the way to the beginning of the Greek rule. So we're going in detail back over this again. And we clearly see that none of these four kingdoms are intended by these, uh, these leaders to be a restoration of, of the Jewish people and the reason we I say that is because the Jewish people are still in bondage here we are 3,000 years almost from these days and the Jewish people even though they have a have been made a nation again in 1948 you know they've been restored to their land they are still not restored to all of their land and they live under Gentile threat every single day in fact, they even have Gentiles in their most holy place up there where they have the Dome of the Rock. So they're still not restored, but the Bible promises, and I've told you so often of Zechariah chapter 12 where he says that he will restore them. He will open their eyes. And Paul, of course, tells us in Romans you know, 10 and 11 that all Israel will be saved. God's going to keep his covenant with his people. The Persian Empire tried to wipe out the Jewish people. Not here in the beginning, but as we get towards the end during the reign of Xerxes that we talked about, you're going to read this story in uh, Esther about the plot of Haman. Okay, so we see that the Persians, they may have started off good, but towards the end, what are they going to do? Through Haman's plot, they try to wipe out the Jewish people. We're also going to see the Greek Empire. After Alexander the Great, they tried to wipe out the Jewish people during the reign of Antiochus IV. And we call him Antiochus Epiphanes, where he desecrates the temple you know he sets up the pig there and just and, and just I mean he it's the abomination of desolation it's talked about in Daniel chapter 7 so we're going to see that he tries to wipe out the Jewish in fact he does he kills a lot of Jewish people he attempted to kill every Jew who would not renounce their commitment to God and embrace his Greek culture so it starts off good but it's going to turn bad we know that verse 3 of Daniel 11 and then it says and a mighty king will arise and he will rule with great authority and do as he pleases. Now, who comes after the Persian Empire, the Medo-Persian Empire? What's the next one? The Greek Empire. And who is that famous leader of the Greek Empire? Alexander the Great, okay? This is Alexander the Great. In fact, you, if you're talking to friends and people you know that don't know anything about the church or God or the Bible, they've been to school. And if they've been to school, they've heard of Alexander the Great. And so the, oh, well, I've heard of Alexander the Great. Well, look, the Bible's talking about him, okay? Now, this prophecy in chapter 11 is not going to say much about Alexander the Great because he did no harm to Jerusalem. Let me tell you something I found out. Josephus said, it's a lengthy little reading, but I was reading this. Josephus says that when Alexander the Great came to Jerusalem, so he'd conquered, he'd conquered everything, he he. In fact, uh, historians say he'd done conquered, done conquered so many uh, kingdoms and so much area that he wept because there was nothing else for him to conquer. That's what some historians say, okay? But when he come to the area of Jerusalem, um, he was shown the book of Daniel by the high priest. And Alexander was telling this high priest that he had previously had a dream or a vision before he come to Jerusalem that he saw all these people dressed in white linen, okay? The Jewish people dressed in white linen. And he felt that this vision was coming from God. So when he arrives in Jerusalem and he sees all these Jewish people dressed in white, dressed in their robes, he felt, oh man, I better be good to these people because God's given me this vision. So he actually comes up to the high priest and salutes him. And he establishes a good, kind treatment to the Jewish people he doesn't, plund he doesn't allow his soldiers to plunder the city and take all of the treasures like he did in every other city as he come through there. He, he wouldn't let them do that. He wouldn't let them to destroy the city. Uh, because when he read this book of Daniel and he saw that there's a, 
conquering king from Greece over the Jewish people, he figured it must be about him. The prophecy was about him, so he's trying to change the, the prophecy, right? Because he figures that can't be good if I'm going against God. So he comes in, actually, he's kind to the Jewish people, and he gave them their request. They wanted to be left alone for what, right? Sacrifices in the temple. In fact, they even allow Alexander the Great to come into the temple and sacrifice. Now, this is coming from the Jewish historian Josephus. All, all that I just told you is not biblical, okay? These are secular uh, historical writings. But Josephus goes down in the history as a trustworthy historian, and you can look at a lot of his in, antiquities and, and a lot of the things that he wrote and get a lot of history there. All right, so look at verse 4. We know that this is this verse 3 is the mighty king will arise. He will rule with great authority and do as he please. That's Alexander the Great. We know that that prophecy came true. Detail. Everything Alexander the Great wanted to do, he did. Verse 4. But as soon as he has arisen, his kingdom will be broken up and parceled out towards the four points of the compass. Though not to his own descendants, nor according to his authority which he wielded, for his sovereignty will be uprooted and given to others besides them. We already know from looking back in history, we've talked about this before, that Alexander the Great did not last long. He conquered the world and then died at age 32, 33, whichever history point you want to agree with. Some say 32, some say 33, I don't care. Close enough. The prophecy is true here. It said as soon as he has arisen, his kingdom will be broken up. And that's exactly what happened. And we saw that back in chapter 6, that as soon as Alexander the Great died, he didn't have any heirs of, of, that were worthy of taking over the throne. You know, Philip and some of these guys, they couldn't do it. A couple of sons, they couldn't do it. They weren't really his uh, biological children. One of them wasn't. I think one of them had a mental issue. So, so what happened is there was none of his heirs who could take over the throne, which is just what it says there in verse, verse 4, not of his own descendants, okay, nor according, he didn't get to appoint them because he's dead. But here comes uh, these four generals that we saw in chapter 6. And they divided the kingdom, the Greek Empire, among these four generals. Um, and this all started in 323 B.C. And these four generals that the prophecy is telling us, these, and it says here, uh, it's the four, look back at verse 4, toward the four points of the compass, okay? You might read it also in chapter 6, it's different. Uh, but it's talking about the four generals that divided the kingdom. And they ruled in Macedonia, they ruled in Asia Minor, they ruled in Syria, and they ruled in Egypt. Okay? Look on the screen at verse 8 of chapter 8. Then the male goat magnified himself exceedingly, but as soon as he was mighty, the large horn was broken. Now remember we talked about that, that's... Alexander the Great, okay? So Daniel already has got been told about this before. He's telling him again. It's the same guy. He is the large horn. It's broken. And in its place, there came up four conspicuous horns. A horn is always a symbol of what in prophecy? Power. So this is the four kings, or I mean, sorry, the four generals that we're talking about here in chapter 11 also. And it says towards the four winds of heaven. So that's who's coming to lead and the prophecy that's being given to Daniel again is the exact same thing. We're not being told anything different, okay? Note there's no contradictions in the Bible. It's all the same stuff. Look at verse 5. <clears throat> then the king of the south will grow strong, along with one of his princes who will gain ascendancy over him and obtain dominion. His dominion will be a great dominion indeed. And after some years they will form an alliance, and the daughter of the king of the south will come to the king of the north to carry out a peaceful arrangement, but she will not retain her position of power, nor will he remain with his power, but she will be given up, along with those who brought her in and the one who sired her as well as he who supported her in those times. Now, look, watch the detail in this prophecy, okay? Two of the four generals gained the most power out of those four. And these two generals constantly fight over Jerusalem because Jerusalem lies in between the two territories that these two generals control. Now, the one general is what is referred to as the king of the south. 
and that's Egypt. And his name was Ptolemy, okay? So this is Ptolemy's dynasty. He's in the south. He's the king of the south. This is Egypt. The other king is the king of the north, or the general is the king of the north, and that's Syria. And that's the Seleucid dynasty. So you got the Ptolemies and the Seleucids. One's in the north, one's in the south, and guess what lies right, right smack dab in the middle of them? Jerusalem. They want that area. So they begin to fight over this area. At first, the Seleucid king in Syria, and remember, the Seleucid is the north, the northern area, had been a subject of Ptolemy, okay? He was weaker, but in time, he becomes more powerful. Is that not what we just read in the prophecy there, okay? So the king of the south proposed a marriage alliance because now he's not, Ptolemy's area is not as powerful. He fears this problem. He fears this war. He doesn't want this. So he proposes a marriage alliance to unite kingdom. All right. So you see this in verse six. They will form an alliance, and the daughter of the king of the south will come to the king of the north. So here comes this marriage alliance to unite the kingdoms. Her name was Princess Berenice, and she was the daughter of Ptolemy the second from the south. And she married the Seleucid king, and his name was Antiochus the second. And they had a child, it was a baby boy. However, right after this happens, this king, Ptolemy II, he dies suddenly. Oh, he wanted this alliance, he got it worked out. There's supposed to be a treaty of peace between the two countries. But as soon as this happens, he dies. Okay? Now, once he died, this Antiochus II, he immediately divorces his wife, Berenice, puts her away, and his child, the baby boy, okay? And he goes back to his former wife, and her name was Laodice, L-A-O-D-I-C-E. Well, this former wife, Laodice, now she doesn't trust Antiochus anymore, so she has him poisoned. Then she had Berenice and the baby boy and her attendants murdered. So this Laodice woman, she ain't a whole lot of compromise in her. She kills everybody. And she has them all murdered in 246 B.C. Now after her reign of terror, her power, her influence, Laodice, she made her son, Seleucus II, uh, she put him on the throne of the Syrian dynasty. You well, know, this obviously, now we're back to the original war that we were going to have, that Ptolemy the second, now y'all just, just losing me here, because I know this is tough, okay? But what I wanted you to hear from these, even though if you don't remember these names, is that the angels given this detailed prophecies hundreds of years before it happens. And all of these things happen just like the angel saying it was going to happen. And so that's why I wanted you to read the details about Berenice and this daughter and this alliance, and all of these things happen. Well, obviously... This started a war again between the two, okay? Between the Ptolemies and the Seleucids. Now look at verse 7. But one of the descendants of her line will arise in his place, and he will come against their army and enter the fortress of the king of the north, and he will deal with them and display great strength, okay? Princess Berenice's brother, Ptolemy III, his name, uh, Ptolemy III, Eurogetes, the king in Egypt. All right, so he will enter, he will come against their army and enter the fortress of the king of the north, and he will deal with them and display great strength. Also their gods, little g-gods, with their metal images and their precious vessels of silver and gold, he will take into captivity to Egypt, and he, on his part, will refrain from attacking the king of the north for some years. Then the latter will enter the realm of the king of the south, but will return to his own land. His sons will mobilize and assemble a multitude of great forces, and one of them will keep on coming and overflow and pass through that he may again wage war up to his, up to his very fortress. So here comes this Berenice's brother who's going to come back. Remember, Berenice got killed by this crazy woman. So now the brother Ptolemy is coming back to exact revenge against them. So he's coming in. And he had a successful a campaign against the north. That happened from 245 to 241 B.C. 
Later, the Syrian kingdom tried to retaliate against him. They even attempted to come as far as to invade Egypt. Now, it didn't work, but this Ptolemy, he actually lives four years past this Seleucus II. And then Seleucus II, his sons, they come on the scene and they keep up this war against Egypt. Now look back at verse 10. And it says, his sons will mobilize and assemble a multitude of great forces. This was fulfilled in one of Seleucus' sons, Seleucus III and Antiochus III. These were his two sons, two of his sons. Both of them were successful generals, okay? But Seleucus III, he only rules a short time, and then comes the brother, the final brother, Antiochus III. And in a furious battle, this latter son, Antiochus III, he conquers the Holy Land, Jerusalem, which was this buffer between the kings of the south and the kings of the north. And he takes back the Holy Land from the dominion of, of the Ptolemies. Now I know that this is a, some tough stuff here to hear, but I want you to hear the exact the, the, the details here. The angel tells Daniel all of these things long before they happen, even down to the exact deal detail about his sons coming in. All right, and he, and where and where they're going to come and and how they're going to uh, pass through and and how they're going to uh, wage war up to his very fortress, and he comes into the Holy Land. Now, we're, at, we're up to Antiochus III. We will eventually get to Antiochus IV, okay? And uh, I decided to stop here tonight at verse 10 uh, because I knew that this was a whole lot of historical information. If you want to go, uh, obviously, I keep telling you each week to do some of your own studies. MacArthur, if you go listen to his sermons, he pretty much does a sermon on the whole dadgum chapter, right? So you're going to have to get a lot of your... Uh, details from other commentaries and I, in fact I told Destiny I've gotten more information from non-biblical commentaries just looking at history you know on these people which I walked away from it thinking wow isn't God cool you read something kind of boring maybe to you but then you get to walk away and thinking man God gave those detailed prophecies now what does that do for you guys tonight when you're thinking your faith your trust in God's word do you walk away feeling a little stronger in your faith you walk away feeling, you know what? That's pretty cool. Even though I don't understand it, it sounds pretty cool. So, anybody have any questions or comments tonight?